There's No Place Like Home, the Youth Acceptance Project session. My name is Rani Shahajis. Um, I will be your care moderator for today. Today's presenter is Vita Kavar. Hi, I'm Vita Kavar. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the clinical director at Family Builders uh, in Oakland. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing space with you today to tell you about our, um, our in intervention. Uh, I have been uh, a director of different types of programs throughout California, such as group homes, foster care, intensive treatment foster care at the time, uh, ILP, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and when I came to um, Family Builders, I took on the role of clinical um, clinical director, and uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you um, our intervention and, and what we've done. So. Um, our learning objectives today, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the experience of LGBTQ youth in foster care. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about well, the Youth Acceptance Project. And we're also going to be discussing some resources um, that are needed to support the families of LGBTQ plus youth. Really want to start with thinking about why this matters. Why are we talking about LGBTQ plus youth? So we know that na na nationwide, about 30%, it's actually closer to 34% now, 34% of youth in the child welfare system in the U.S. identifies LGBTQ+. So that's one in three kiddos. And so whenever I have a worker or someone who tells me I don't have any, any of these kids on my, on my caseload, I say, well, unless you have less than three, I, I think you do, but you probably don't know about it, and you know because it's not written on someone's face uh, if they're LGBTQ+. So, and it's important to notice to note as well that 60% of these youth, these LGBTQ youth in child welfare, are youth of color. So we really have to be thinking about the intersection of the experience of the systemic uh, racism that's experiencing and the LGBTQ plus stigma, uh, and how that uh, that really intersects in in their lives. We also know that one in uh, one in five young people in the juvenile justice system identifies LGBTQ plus. And 85% of these youth are youth of color. So again, we're talking about this intersection, but we're talking about one in five, which is really a huge number. Um, for, of the 1.6 million uh, kiddos on the street of this country, almost 50% identify as LGBTQ plus. And that's also a huge number. They're disproportionately represented in the commercial sexually exploited children. Uh, because of the high level of homelessness, housing insecurity, food insecurity, being, you know, not being accepted or affirmed, running away from placements, running away or being kicked out of their own, their own homes. So um, we always want to be, you know, thinking about, about, about these um, statistics. Furthermore, and unfortunately, the statistics for suicidality for these youth is extremely high. So the Trevor Project has been doing a national survey since 2020, and um, unfortunately, the numbers have gone worse. I don't think that's surprising. But in 2022, they interviewed 34,000 youth throughout the country between the age of 13 and 17. And of those, those, those kids, they discovered that nearly 18% of LGBTQ uh, kids attempted suicide in the past 12 months. So that's actually attempted not just thought about it, but attempted suicide. And that includes more than one in five transgender and non-binary youth. So we're really talking about life and death when we're talking about our LGBTQ kiddos. 50% of LGBTQ youth and 53% of trans and non-binary youth report having seriously considered suicide. So it's also a huge number. And unfortunately, often those that, that uh, report having seriously considered suicide Often, if things uh, do not get better for them, then they they become part of that 18% who actually attempt suicide, and worse, perhaps being successful at it. 28% of LGBTQ youth experience housing instability also reported an attempted suicide in the past year, and nearly 60% of transgender and non-binary youth did not receive the mental health care or medical medical care that they needed because they were not uh, trusting that their uh, providers would have competency in working, working with them. You know, I often hear a, a lot of um, therapists, uh, I'm sorry, kids who will tell me, you know, I, I, I came out to my therapist, but we never talked about it again after that. Or I came out to my therapist, 
but they told me that I should wait until I'm 18 to come out or they told or they forced me to come out. So a lot of the things, you know, um, uh, healthcare provider, mental health care provider may not be trained in how to work with different sexual orientation and gender identities. So it's important for us to know that, that you know, we're truly, truly talking about life and death. In the same um, research brief from the Trevor Project, they also discovered that LGBTQ plus youth with a, with a, a history of foster care are three times more likely to attempt suicide. So that's three times more than what I've already mentioned. Um, I'm not gonna read all the detail on this slide. Like uh, uh, Ronnie mentioned earlier, this, this will be made available to you. Um, and, and you can look, you can also go on the uh, Trevor Project 2020 survey, and it has tons, tons, tons more information on, on the statistics uh, of our youth and their experiences in child welfare, experiences in school, et cetera. Um, one thing that I, I do want to talk, because I, I often want to talk about intersectionality, and in the same, same surveys, you know, they also discovered that nearly one in four Black LGBTQ youth in foster care have reported suicide attempt in the past year. Again, we're talking about really, really, um, like you said, Ronnie, in the, in, in, in the chat, wow, like, yes, that's really big. You have also, um, you, you know, the, the the percentage on how it, it's it's divided depending on on um, uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, Twelve percent of LGBTQ YC youth att attempted suicide in the past year, compared to, and then you have, you know, Native, Indigenous, Middle Eastern, Northern African, multiracial, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander youth. Um, it's it's really high, folks. The suicide rates are extremely uh, high. We also know that trans, trans and non-binary uh, youth who say that most people, all or most people who respect their pronouns are 50% less likely to attempt a suicide just by respecting someone's pronouns and calling them the name that they have asked you to call them, you are lowering the, the percent, the, the, lowering by 50% the fact that they, they will not try to, to kill themselves. Um, Transgender and non-binary youth who have access to binders, shapewear, clothing, also report a, huge, a very large less amount of suicide in the past year. And very most importantly, 93% of teens who, um, teens who received parental support regarding gender identity were 93% less likely to attempt suicide. That's 93%. If they, if they perceive that their parents are supportive of who they are, uh, they are 93% less likely to attempt suicide. Um, again, a, a, really, a, a really flabbergasting number. But now we, we know that in contrast of all this horrible stuff I've shared before, that there are things that we can do to ensure the, the safety of, of our youth. So, you know, his, historically, LGBTQ youth whose families were not supportive have had less set chance of reunification. They often end up in shelter, LGBTQ shelter or places like this, and people are reluctant to return them to their families. They think that, well, their families were rejecting in the first place. Why are we going to work with these families? But we also know that the, first, the, the, the what is the most important thing for these young people is the love of their family. They want to be home. They want to be home. They want to be loved for who they are. They want to be their authentic self with the people they love the most, right? Um, we, uh, we also know that LGBTQ plus, plus youth of color are disproportionately represented in system and due to systemic racism and LGBTQ plus stigma. And they get treated very differently than, than other kids in, in, in the system. LGBTQ youth who don't do well, LGBTQ youth don't do well in systems of care because of discrimination, bias, and they often languish in congregate care. They end up in group homes, SDRTPs because a lot of foster parents don't want to deal, especially with trans and non-binary youth. So they really have nowhere to go. And we've, have, we've worked with a, a number of, of, of transgender and non-binary youth who are stuck at what they call the welcome center or you know, the point of, of entry in the system because they cannot find foster homes for them. And these are kids who, you know, who come to the system because they ran, out, ran away maybe from their parents or their home, and they have not done anything, you know, they may not even have the trauma that certain kids may have having been part of the system, but they still cannot find anywhere to go. 
I also want to mention that when we're talking about um, LGBTQ youth of color in the system, we also want to make sure that we are we put forth and we are aware as we're working with LGBTQ of, of color that they are being treated very differently than their white peer. And by that, I mean, even in the way that they're being diagnosed, even in the way that they're being given medication, I have seen stark contrast between white kids who get ADHD and, you know, uh, an ADHD medication. And when I look at the youth of color, they're getting, you know, defiance disorder, you know, a lot more severe disorder and medication that are a lot, a lot, um, lot stronger and, and, and frankly, that they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be getting. Um, and so again, we're talking about systemic racism right here. And, um, and we, 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 have, we have to be aware of that. We really do. Um, so the, the Youth Acceptance Project is one of, one of, in, one of the interventions that um, helps families reunify or better yet not be disrupted in the first place. We really were thinking like, why can't LGBTQ youth have permanency plan like any other kid and that their families and their communities be involved in their lives? And through our intervention, we have found out that families can and actually do change. Um, and so this has been very interesting for us to do this. So I'm going to play a little video uh, right now, um, and then we'll continue um, talking about the, the I identify as a trans male. I identify as pansexual. I identify as gender fluid, and I use they, them pronouns. I identify as bisexual. I identify as a transgender male, also gay, and foster youth. I kind of started to think about it when I was about nine years old, um, and then when I was 11 is when I first came out to myself. I was born as a female, but I've never really felt that way ever since I was little, ever since I can remember, really. Last year I was identifying as transgender, but then I started realizing, I don't, I don't know if I'm quite there yet. People were telling me, no, you're a girl, you're a girl, and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I know who I am. And then it got to a point where I was like, wait, do I know who I am? Identity is something you have to discuss through yourself. Nobody can make it for you. You have to make it yourself. It makes me very unique. That's, uh, that's what I know. For me, acceptance is really looking at someone and realizing no matter who they identify as, what they're going through, you're still going to have that care for them. You're still gonna help them out when they need it. You're still gonna be there for them. Being like welcomed and being like cared for. A lot of foster homes just won't accept LGBT youth. You never know, is this family gonna accept me? Are they gonna be okay with me being transgender, gender fluid? And that's where my identity struggled too, because I was like, okay, well then, whose kid am I? Where is my home? Where do I belong? It's been hard not to like compare myself to other people. I was called a faggot. I was called a dyke. You don't belong here, tranny, faggot. I was depressed. I was lonely. I was hopeless. I felt like nothing. I felt empty. I felt like nothing mattered. <sighs> to me, it's amazing. It's felt like a safe haven for me. After so many years of like hiding and being, ca uh, being cautious, I finally get to actually express who I want to be. It feels like I'm at home, like I'm free to be who I want to be and be as loud as I want. There's always going to be people that will 
understand you and will feel like home eventually. Like, you'll find your place. You will get through this. It won't last forever. If you are struggling or if you need someone, seek them out. You don't have to hide. You don't have to suffer. It's okay to be scared and you're gonna be scared. But remember that no matter what, you're not alone. You're not. There's always someone out there who does care about you. Yeah, this is a video I can't, I, every time I watch, it still gives me goosebumps, especially, you know, when, when especially when they start talking about um, acceptance and what it means and when they want to share their flair with other LGBTQ kids. So um, it's a, it's, it's, it's a really important um, video, I think, that, that shows that, you know, these kids are just like any other kids. And if we support them and they have the support of their community, they will thrive just like any other child. Um, and so it's, um, and yes, I agree with you, is that sometimes we feel that the kids of today are struggling, the LGBTQ kids of today are struggling just as much as the ones from before. And so I think this is why we really need to be changing, um, changing the way we're working with LGBTQ youth and making sure that they feel that they're uh, seen and they're being supported. So what is the Youth Acceptance Project? So um, we started the Youth Acceptance Project in Alameda, Alameda County and Santa Clara County we were working with a lot of LGBTQ youth who were stuck in the system, and they were always talking about their families, but the uh, uh, DCFS were, would not let us be in touch with their families because that's where they were abused or that's where they were kicked out. But really, they were just languishing in care. And so we thought, well, what if you give us a chance to work with those families? What if we were able to work with those families and actually have them become accepting of their children? And so we started this, this intervention. It's a clinical intervention with, developed by family builders. And we wanted to meet the specific need of LGBTQ youth and their families, uh, whether they're in out of home care or whether they're already, or, or they're in, in, at risk of being in out of home care. We wanted to, we realized that in order to have L, the, the well being of LGBTQ kids, we need to, to get to their families, we need to get to their parents. And so this is a very distinct, solution-focused, strength-based, and trauma-informed family engagement. And we have a lot, it is steeped in cultural humility. We really, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we really talk about ethnicity, race, religion. You know, we allow parents to discuss these things with us instead of like making them ashamed for their beliefs. We actually invite them to talk to us about these things. Um, the goal of YAP is family preservation, family reunification, and really, at, at, at the bottom of it, it's, it's, it's to improve the permanency outcome and the well-being of LGBTQ youth. Because we know, like you, I said earlier, parental support is an essential protective factor for those, for those youth. So our theory of change is that early sensitive engagement intervention with families can support change that make a significant impact on the family's functioning and a lasting impact on the overwhelmness of LGBTQ plus and gender expensive youth. So we help family process their grief, fear, and loss that is often associated with when their kids come out to them. So, um, you know, whether they have very strong um, beliefs from where they're from, um, it could be religious belief, it could be um, belief from, you know, um, cultural belief, things like that. We really just go in and we meet their families, the families where they're at. We, in a way, we are extending the compassion we have that we're asking them to have for their kids. We're extending it to them as well, to the families. Because without doing that, we cannot work with them and they, and they will not be open to listening to what we have to say and, and offer some psychoeducational. Um, often, if, if you go in and you offer psychoeducational information right away, parents will close the door. Parents will just not want, they will shut down. They don't want to hear it, you know. And we have to understand that the parents are also going through their own grief, perhaps of the child they thought they were, uh, they were raising, you know. If they thought they were raising a boy and now the child is non-binary or, or, or transgender or, or an other gender as well, genders, there's third and fourth genders. So we really want to make sure that we really address the grief that the parents are going through away from their children, obviously. That's really the key, because we don't want the child to have to, to, to listen to these things. 
So we work with the child and the family separately at first. We also talk, uh, we also bring out a lot of the fears family have for their children. You know, families like, well, I don't want my child to be gay. Or I don't want my child to be trans because, you know, what's going to happen in five years from now? What's going to happen when they go to school like this? dress like this so you know you can it's like okay sounds like you're really afraid for your child you know we 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 are able to kind of like uh kind of peel the onion and for them to realize that yes i'm afraid for my child i'm afraid of things that's going to happen and they're also afraid of their own you know they're also afraid of perhaps of their own family the reaction of their faith community uh their church whoever they go to you know so there's a lot of fear that associated when a child comes out and so it is the other thing we, we really want to talk about is, is the loss, the loss that they're experiencing. You know, if they're parenting a child that they thought they were parenting and the child saying, no, actually, I don't want to use this. This is not the name I want you to call me anymore. We have to realize that parents spend a lot of time picking a name for their child. It is not something that just comes out of a box or, or, or a hat. So it's important that we allow the parents to really um, process their loss about these things before we even ask them to look into who their child is and realize their child is still their child. Um, and so we have three three phases, engagement, implementation, and transition. And we really assist families in loving, in, in getting back to loving their children for who they are. Um, we, in a way, we hold the hands of the parents or the caregiver to move the families from rejection all the way to supporting their child. And that looks very different for every family. We don't expect the families to go into pride and go, woo, woo, my child is great if they want to do that. I have no problem at all. But we don't, you know, affirmation and support and love for their child may look very different, you know. Um, for example, we, we remind families who are very affectionate to begin with, we remind them that being affectionate towards their LGBTQ kids is very important because if they don't do that, the, the kid's going to be complete, feeling completely rejected and there's something wrong with them. But we also have to take in, in consideration the type of family we're talking to. Maybe this is not a family who, who, um, who does that, who does hugs or who kisses or, you know. So that's why we take a long time getting to know the family first so that we're not going to be asking them to do things that they're not doing to, they're not doing to begin with. So what do uh, our YAP provider actually do? So like I said, we work directly with the parents and caregivers um, and youth to, prov to provide emotional support, improve uh, their communication. We don't go in saying, oh, we're here to change your, your mind about your child. We're going to say, hey, we want to improve the relationship you have with your child. So let me, I want to get to know you. Um, we listen, we validate, and, and help process the parents' feelings. We also make it very clear that the parents or the family are the expert of their own family. We're not. So we come in in a very cultural uh, hu humility uh, approach because, again, we are, not, uh, we are not part of the family, and they're expert on their own families. Um, and we also really spend time uh, trying to figure out what was their experience with other parts of the system, you know, um, we, we have to be very mindful that we may be with families who have had very negative experience with systems of care. So we have to be very gentle with them and we have to really talk about that with them. It's like, what has the experience been with, with systems? You know, I, I want to make sure that I don't do this when I'm with you. If there's something special that you don't want me to do, let's have this conversation. Um, uh, we also... Pro when we get to really uh, establish a rapport uh, with the family, we then start providing accurate information about sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, which we call SOGI. Um, and we really start dispelling some of the myths and increase the understanding that the parents have about their children. There's, there's many, many, many myths um, that comes, you know, and so, um, you know, now with social media, we have a little bit more information. People have more information about LGBTQ uh, folks, but that's not necessarily the case for, for some of the parents we work with. So we really want to make sure that we dispel some of the myths. You know, things like, oh, my child will never have children. My child can't get married. Uh, my child will not have a regular family, things like that. You know, we, we, we can talk to them about these things, you know. Um, sometimes we attend uh, community meetings with the parents. 
um, even if they want us to go to the school with them and help them or show them how to advocate for their child at school, we'll do that with them. Um, we might go to community meetings, you know, if we find a peace flag, parents and friends of um, lesbian and gay um, uh, uh, children, you know, if, if we find them, and we, might, we might go with them, say, hey, would you like me to come with you in your first meeting? Or if they're asking us to, you know, if it's, this is a gender journey for a child and they say, you know, I don't know what to ask, uh, uh, you know, the pediatrician or, or the gender affirming care provider, what do I do? You know, it's like, okay, do you want to, do you want to write questions together? Would you like me to come with you? You know, we really, we really kind of surround the parent with a lot of support. Um, we give them a lot of resources, you know, um, medical uh, name of medical provider where they can go and ask questions. Um, obviously, those those provider who is who are uh, gender affirming. Um, um, and then one of the things we also do is when the child is if the child is already uh, part of the system, we we really team up with the team, the social worker, the attorney, the casa, the wraparound teams, and so forth to really help make decision about permanency and, and permanency planning to make sure that we maintain a healthy um, contact with, with first family or birth family. Very important that we take in consideration the families. Parents love their children. It may not look like that when the child comes out and they kick them out and I, that, you know, those are horrible um, stuff that happen, but we can go back and we can work with those families. You would be surprised. We have worked with people who are ultra religious and have, we've been able to move them towards, you know, move the needle towards being accepting of, of, of their child. Um, and then when needed, we also provide training. We provide training to county workers. We provide training to different SDRTPs. We provide training to foster parents um, or fo foster family agencies um, on sexual orientation and gender identity, because there's still a lack of understanding around that. Um, for example, we have maybe DCFS workers who will tell us, well, we need to work with this kid uh, and, and deal with their depression first before we do anything that's gender affirming. And so we have to explain, you know, maybe those things go hand in hand. Maybe this child is super depressed because they're constantly looking at themselves in the mirror and, and doesn't reflect who they really are inside. And so in that case, depression might be coming from them being maybe trans or non-binary. So we have to address these things. So we, we spend quite a bit of time really informing um, caregivers and county workers and whoever works with the children. So what have we, what have we seen? So um, our placement stabilization is at 84%. Um, so it is either the child did not leave the home or uh, the child remained at home. So it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it's really good, I should say. Um, it's not 100%, but you know, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, and we also have a 64 um, 64% of return to 64% um, I'm sorry uh, who never left the family. Um, so this is really really great. There's some that we work with foster family, some that return to their families, um, and unfortunately there's always the, the few that remain in care. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a relationship with someone at least because we use the uh, method of permanency where we make sure that the, the children have adults around them that will accept them and affirm them, even if it's not blood family, they still have a family out there that's going to support them and, and, and love them for who they truly are. A little more stats, um, which we're kind of proud of. Um, we, we, have a, we, have in, we have created a tool that's called the Caregiver Affirmation Abacus. And it literally allows our YAP providers, Youth Acceptance Project provider, to measure a caregiver's acceptance of their child. So it goes from never, sometimes, always, uh, never, sometimes, often, always. So for example, the caregiver respects the child's pronoun. Never, often, sometimes, always. So we're, we, we know we're making progress when we can move that needle, right? And we do that, that tool every six months. So with that tool, um, we saw that caregiver affirmation of their children uh, was increased by 88%. So that's, that's pretty big. Um, support of gender expression, 71%. Um, use of respectful language towards their child, 83% of, of uh, increase. And 
85% increase in reconciliation of values. And what that means is we have uh, parents who are able to keep their faith and love their children for who they are. Because we know, you know, we know how important faith and, and culture is to every family. And so it's really important that parents can feel or caregiver can feel that they can still have their faith, but they can still love their children. You know, we sometimes use the, the term, um, and I'm quoting Alok, who's a, a, a writer, a poet, and an activist, who talks about compassion versus understanding. You don't have to understand someone to have compassion towards them. You don't have to always under, understand your child to love your child. So we work a lot with with um, with those kinds of uh, guiding principles. Um, from the CAMS, the Child Adolescent Needs and Service Assessment, this is a little bit older, but um, we had 100% um, of the youth served by YAP showed an increase of overall functioning. 100% of the youth who had suicidal gesture upon referral, referral no longer had them at the end of the services. 100% of self-harm disappeared. 97% of the youth we served uh, reduced uh, risky sexual dating behavior and showed a decrease um, in, in those behavior by the end of services. Um, and 100%, which we're really happy about that, of our kiddos stayed in school um, throughout and at the end of, of YAP services. Um, we're really, really happy with this. We've also been, um, we were part of a federal um, uh, well, uh, uh, improvement, sorry, improvement uh, um, grant, and we were able to be evaluated for five years. We're, we're, we're awaiting our results right now, and we have also hired a firm right now who is also evaluating us because we really would like to be, you know, like an evidence practice or promise, promising practice because we really think that this would really change the way things are for, for families and LGBTQ plus kids um, nowadays. Um, so what are we seeing? Uh, significant, significant reduction in self-harm and suicide, significant decrease in runaways. Um, it's, it's really interesting, you know, we were working with a mom who's ultra religious, whose daughter identified as a lesbian. Um, it took us nine months of engaging this mom um, sometimes she, and this was for, for our worker, for, our, for our, a YAP provider who lived in LA. This mom lived in Santa Clara at the time. It was like a two hour, you know, Santa Clarita, two hour, um, Santa Clarita, I'm sorry, two hour drive back and forth, right? Um, and sometimes the mom wouldn't even open the door, but our provider kept on going and she would te text the mom when she arrived. She'd say, I'm outside. I'd love to come in, but you know, and then the provider would come to me and say, Vida, I don't know what to do anymore. She's not opening the door. And I said, keep going, keep going. And lo and behold, one day, you know, she felt sorry for her to still be there in her car. And so she invited her just to be on the on the stoop of the house and then just had like a 15 minute conversation. And our yeah, provider said, I, you know, I just want to get to know you. You know, I know it's been really tough with you and your daughter lately. So I just want to get to know you, see how I can provide you some support, you know, and Little by little, one day, mom actually let her come into the house, um, and mom cried for nine months, literally every week for nine months. But at some point, something happened where mom was able to actually stop using derogatory language when she was talking to her daughter. You know, she would say things like, you're too pretty to be a lesbian, you shouldn't be, you know, and she was really angry with her, with the daughter's partner. But at some point, she started stopping, and she saw that there was um, something different about her daughter. And I'm talking about this right now because when the mom stopped using bad language, derogatory language, her daughter stopped running away. And that was a key moment for that family when, when they realized, the daughter realized, my mom really loves me, and she's trying hard. And the mom realized, my daughter loves me, and she's not running away anymore. So I just wanted to share that story with you. Um, so our youth are feeling affirmed. They're feeling supported by their family. We work separately with the youth as well. So we, you know, we, we work a lot in affirming who they are. Maybe they're discovering their identities. And so we, we, we hold their hand through that journey. Um, our caregivers are feeling supported because we're here for them. We, we, all, we also call ourselves family advocates. We don't go in saying we're a therapist or a social worker or anything like that. 
we keep children and family together or we reunify them, which is really the most important thing we can, we can think about when we're talking about child welfare. Um, so currently we are providing direct services to counties in the Bay Area. Um, so we, we are in Santa Clara, Alameda, San Francisco, and we were, we've had a contract and we're restarting our contract on May 1st with Marin County, Sonoma, Solano, and Napa. So we have nine, nine counties we're working with in, in California. And then we also now have different sites throughout the country who want to do that in their own jurisdiction. So we do train um, different organization to provide that in their own organization. So we're in New York, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and we have two sites in Missouri who have just started uh, the youth acceptance project. Um, it's it's a very intensive 20 hour training that I that I do, and then we follow that with um, coaching twice a month coaching to make sure that we stay close to the fidelity of the model. Well, that's been a fantastic presentation. Thank you all for your attendance today.